I'm Mike Farrington. Welcome back to my shop, also known as The Boardroom. In this video, I'm going to be organizing my installation or on-site tool set into sustainers. And I get started by making templates that, as accurately as possible, fit the bottoms of each of the sustainers. The motivation for doing this was spurred on by my most recent installation, which I did a video on, and it's called Easiest Wall Paneling Ever. And while I was working on that project, my tools looked like they had barfed all over the customer's hallway and living room, and I was a little embarrassed, so I wanted to come up with a solution that looked a little more professional. And one that helped me stay more organized while working on site. There he is, the shop apprentice, right after haircut. He likes to call the dustpan a shovel. After making the templates, I get started on my first box. And this box is going to hold my power planer, my jigsaw, and my belt sander. And this may seem like an odd combination of tools to put together, but when I'm on site, these three tools get used interchangeably for fitting things. And what I mean by fitting things is scribing shelves to openings, scribing countertops, cutting fillers, and little odds and ends like that. So throughout this video, you'll see me use these rare earth magnets that have a hole in them designed to accept a screw. And combine that with a 3 8 inch screw and you can attach these magnets to half inch thick plywood. In this shot you can see a cutout for the handle of the belt sander to rest in. So that's really it for the first box. A really simple build, but very effective. And it holds these three tools really nicely. Moving right along to box number two, I'm going to put my drill impact driver and my small Bosch driver in this box. My primary goal for this build was to make the drills as easy as possible to take in and out. And during most installations and on-site work, I use a drill more than any other tool, so I wanted this to be convenient. My secondary goals were to make sure the chargers had a nice home as well as a few drivers and drill bits. And when building all these boxes, I didn't have any plans, I didn't draw anything up, I just knew what I wanted them to do. So there's sort of a lot of going back and forth and eyeballing and holding things up and cutting and recutting. It's kind of obnoxious work, but it's also kind of fun at the same time. And because I would be reaching in and out of these boxes constantly, I wanted to make sure there were no splinters, no sharp edges, so I did a lot of sanding. And as you can see, I probably should have made this one a little smaller. It barely fits in. When I was done with this build, I was happy that I achieved all of my goals. All three drills pop in and out easily. The batteries and chargers fit in nicely as well. I was also able to fit in a few accessories like this magnetic wristband, as well as this hook that I attached to my tool belt. And on to box number three. This box was a leftover sustainer when I bought some Festool dominoes, and I don't need a sustainer for my dominoes, so I'm going to turn it into a box that's going to house my 23 gauge pin nailer and my 18 gauge brad nailer. Now you may or may not know this, but nail guns are worthless without nails. So with this build, I wanted to make sure that the nails and the nail guns were held in the same box and then it was reasonably convenient to gain access to the nails. So I cut a bunch of 1 8 inch kerfs into a couple of half inch dividers. And all the spacing on this was just based on real world measurements of the nails I was planning to store in each of these openings. 
After sliding the dividers in and putting the nails in between the dividers, I realized that I couldn't get the nails out. So I decided to cut a little U-shape out of each divider and this would allow me access to the various nails. And this is a neat little trick. Uh, if you have to cut a bunch of parts all the same and you're going to use the bandsaw to do it, nail all the parts together in the waste section and you can kind of cut them all as one and then as the parts fall away you can see here they just fall into little itty bitty pieces. But be careful because as you're finishing the cut all these pieces become loose. And here's my version of a spindle sander. I attach this sanding drum to my 36 year old $25 garage sale find drill press. So here's a technique for locating where your screws are going to go and that's draw out the piece that's to be screwed down and then drill through from the top and then come back on the bottom and finish countersinking. And that piece of plywood is warped. Next, clamp the two pieces together, finish countersinking, and screw them together. And when screwing half-inch plywood, it's really important that you use the right size countersink for the screws that you're using, otherwise the plywood will split. This piece is both a divider and a handle. All right, now it's time to load up. And I keep 18 gauge brads in sizes 5 8 through 2 inches. And for the 23 gauge pin nailer, I keep inch and 3 8 half inch, and 1 inch, as well as a box of little random cutoffs. And in each of these boxes, whenever possible, I would leave some open space just for some extras and odds and ends. And I sized the divider handle such that the tips of the nail guns wouldn't be banging into each other. And I made sure everything was labeled with my excellent penmanship. Next I moved on to making a box for my drawer and doorknob jig. And this is a cool jig that helps install a doorknob and drawer poles. It does some other things too, but that's all I really use it for. And along with that, you need a few accessories, and that's some screws, drill bits, and a couple other odds and ends. All right, so here's the jig. When I bought it, the company was called Precision Caseworks. Now I think they've changed their name, but if you do a Google search, you can learn more. When installing doorknobs and drawer poles, the most common threading is 832, so I stock a few different lengths of those screws, but once in a while you'll bump into a metric size, so I have a few metric screws as well. And my hope with keeping all these screws in stock is that it prevents a run to the hardware store during an install. And if you install a lot of doorknobs or drawer poles, I think this jig is really worth the investment. If you think about it, that's typically at the end of a job, and that's the time when you really don't want to make a mistake. So having a nice jig to help the process along is a good idea. And some painter's tape is a must. I like to use that so I don't have to put a tick mark on the door or drawer. All right, next in line would be what I would refer to as my main toolbox or just a general toolbox. And this was by far the most challenging of the builds, but I think it's the one that's going to yield the most benefit. So this is a size 5 T-lock sustainer, and once again, it's a leftover from when I bought the large size Festool Domino. And I would just like to mention all of the sustainers that I'm using. I didn't buy any of the Festool ones. They just came with tools that I bought. So, I mean, I guess I bought them, but I didn't pay for them for this project. The ones that I bought for this project were made by Makita. And they're like about a half or a third the cost of the Festool ones. Now, the one downside to the Makita sustainers is that they don't have the T-lock handles. But to me, the savings was worth it. So here's a quick backstory on this build. I have some other sustainers that I bought probably 10 years ago, and I built a few trays for them to hold nails and other items. 
And when I built the trays, I really didn't do a very good job on them. And here it is nearly 10 years later, and I'm just finally getting around to redoing them. So when going into this build, I had a little different mentality, and that mentality was, I want to be using this thing in 10 years. So I wanted it to be nice, and I wanted it to function well. And I also wanted it to be adjustable and flexible if I were to change out tools or add some tools. So uh, I took my time. I actually spent about a day and a half building this thing. And when building this thing, it was really two steps forward, one step back. I would have to put it together, test things, make some cuts, take it apart, adjust. So it was a little slow going, but I did enjoy the challenge. When getting organized for this project, or I guess you could say designing, I decided to lay all my tools out on the bench and I grouped them by size and then also by how often I used them and I tried to create spaces where larger tools would be grouped together and smaller tools would be grouped together and then I tried to make sure that I could access the tools that I use most often very easily. After some trial and error, I found that the best way to proceed was just to drill a hole for a tool, cut an opening for a tool, put it in place, and move on to the next tool. And I found that I was able to kind of crunch the tools a little closer together and fit more in by using this method. One of the challenges I ran into was cutting slots for putty knives. And I found that if I just drilled a series of holes and used a multi-tool to kind of ream them out a little bit, I could get a decent slot. And it ended up working pretty good and it was faster than setting up a router. And each time I created a home for a tool, I would take it off my workbench and just throw it on a cart. At this point, I was done with the right side and the left side. Now it was time to work on the center section, and I thought it would be a good idea if I put some drawers in. And I got started by running some 1 8 inch grooves, which the bottoms of the drawer box would fit into. After that, I assembled all the parts. And at this point, I realized I needed a handle, so I just made one out of a piece of plywood. But I definitely want to change this. At some point, I'll go in and put a one-inch dowel as a handle instead. I think that would work much better. With the main body assembled, I turned my attention to building some drawer boxes. And I used one quarter inch ply for the sides and one eighth inch ply for the bottoms. Here are a few quick notes about the sustainers I'm using. As you've noticed that I've used a few Festool sustainers and I've also used a few Makita sustainers. I could be wrong on this, but it is my understanding that all sustainers are made by the same company and they're just sold to the different tool manufacturers. And this is cool because the quality between the sustainers will be equal, even though the price for the Makita is roughly half. Now there are a few downsides to buying the Makita sustainers and the first is they only come in sizes one through four whereas for this toolbox that I'm building it's a size five meaning it's a little taller. And second the newer Festool sustainers use what's called a T-lock handle and this means you can open and close the lid and connect sustainers together using just one latch. Compare that to the Makita that it's two latches to close the lid and two additional latches to link cases together. In my opinion, these are the major differences between the Makita and Festool sustainers. There are a few other minor differences, but you can do your own research and determine whether it's worth the extra cost for the Festool sustainers. So here I'm just cutting out a notch for my block plane. The block plane actually sticks down into this drawer compartment a little, so I just created some clearance. And here's a quick 360 view of the finished product. All right, so here are the tools I wanted to fit into this toolbox. Let's see if I succeeded. All right, now let's load this sucker up and see how it works.
Keep in mind as I'm putting these tools away that this is my installation tool kit. And over the years, I've really pared this kit down to what I think is essential for installing millwork and cabinets. Also keep in mind that this is not a complete tool set. I do have some other tools that I did not build into this and um, I just kind of bring those out as needed and they're tools that just get used so rarely I didn't want to dedicate space to them. I like to keep a few small rare earth magnets and I use these for marking the locations of studs. It's never a good look to be surprised by your own work, but after loading the tools and putting this thing in the sustainer, I was actually surprised with how good it worked. And I'm really looking forward to using this thing out in the field and seeing if it helps me work more efficiently. Really, this project is going to be an ongoing experiment. I don't know if it'll make me more efficient or it will keep my workspace more tidy. And I don't know how long this will last. Uh, it could break on the third use. I really don't know. But I thought it was worth giving a shot. If in the future I make any large changes or something catastrophic happens, I will put together some small update videos. I also have plans to do some more recording out in the field, so I wanted my camera gear to be organized in a sustainer as well. All right, for the last sustainer build, I'm gonna put an air compressor in a sustainer. And this may seem a little extreme, but packing the air compressor in my van is really annoying. It's just, it takes up a ton of space because you can't put anything on top of it. And the extension cord and air hose are always flopping everywhere and I trip over it. And so I wanted to make it neat and tidy. And I think at this point you'll agree with me that this is more of a diagnosis of OCD than a video about organizing tools. So I get started by unbolting the motor and squishing it over closer towards the storage tank. And there's just a copper hose that connects the compressor pump to the storage tank, so that just kind of bends a little bit. And the second step is to cut off the handle. And next I filed off the burrs to help protect my sensitive skin from any ouchies. And I drilled two new holes for the motor and bolted that down. And it passes the shake test, so it's good to go. And when I dropped the compressor in for the first time, I kind of almost thought this sustainer was built for this compressor. I bought this compressor back in 2007, and when it arrived, I took it out of the box and I thought to myself, this thing isn't going to last a month. It just felt cheaply made. But here we are 11 years later and this thing's still kicking butt. It's been one of my best tools. So you may be wondering what I'm going to do about the heat that a compressor generates. And my thought is, uh, one, I'll drill a couple holes in the box, which I'll show later in this video. And two, when I do an average install, the compressor really only cycles one or two times because I'm only shooting, you know, 10, 20, 30 nails at most, hanging some crown molding, putting in a few pieces of base molding, and then I'm out of there. So I think what I'll do is I'll let it run with the lid open, and then I'll close the lid after that as I need to move it around the job site. And for now, that's going to be good enough. If I feel like the compressor's overheating, I'll make adjustments from there. This is a 5 16 drill bit, and I think I was able to get 16, 18 holes in the recesses on the back and sides.
All right, so that's it for now. Close it out with a few shots of the finished product. At this point, I'm real happy with the results, but the proof is going to be in the pudding. I need to use these a few times to really know whether I've done a good job with this build or not. If you've made it this far in the video, I would be very interested to hear your thoughts and opinions of whether this was a good idea or not. I would also be interested to hear if you have any ideas to help improve. After all, this is going to be a work in progress for me. So let me know your thoughts or ideas in the comments section below. Till next time, thanks for watching.